Well, Todd, with, with bolt-action guns, I, I mean, I think when you think about this sport um, or this recreation that, that people do, whether they're hunters or competitors, um, or they actually do this as a profession, uh, a lot of people start off with that foundation of that, that, that traditional Remington 700. And I kind of look at it like the, you know, the uh, Ford Mustang. You know, you went, you bought the, you bought the Ford Mustang, and, and now later on, as you're getting more involved in, in the community, you're starting to think about, well, how do I soup it up? And, and the first thing that generally comes to mind is is that stock so I guess my first question to you is um, is is that a good upgrade to do to get a new stock for that gun and then not only that but is as far as the community goes there's that big old debate about whether I go you know with uh, glass bedding or, or pillars and, and is that really worth it yeah I, I tell you what let's just start out with a normal Remington action with okay. a, more of a traditional style stock you know if you look here this cheek weld is not adjustable it's actually fairly low all right so we can't do anything with our recoil pad either however we do have a detachable mag all right so it just doesn't have a floor plate like we did in the past we can actually okay. put a 10 round mag here all right the reason this is set up this high though is some people say yeah but you actually need lower rings well with the pictini rail on the front of this weapon system here it's set up so it aligns all right from the scope to your night vision so you don't really have a choice of going up and down that much so that's one of the disadvantages of having this type of system but for a hunting stock there's nothing wrong with it you know it, it's a real nice system something you might want to upgrade to is something like this this weapon here again detachable mag plus now we get have adjustable cheek weld all right so this is actually really nice good setup here good hunting style stock again but nearly a tactical stock and what you talked about a while ago this system would probably be glass bedded now they may actually remove a lot of this interior on the on the stock itself but you're probably going to have glass bedding on the action myself i mean if, if i was going to shoot a stock like this yes i'd go ahead and glass bed the action but okay i would rather go ahead and do the glass bedding on the pillar blocks on this, another type of action so first thing is i've got that you know, Mustang 5.0. I want, I want to start getting her supercharged. I want to get her primed up for race day. If, if I'm looking at buying a new stock, what you're saying is the, at a basic, I at least need to start working on some type of adjustability as far as length of pull. And then not only that, but comb height as well. Absolutely, and the comb height to me is actually even more important. Most of the time people can shoot with a shorter stock. If you actually start pushing your stock out long, people start canning on the rifle to get their proper eye relief. So. The, the cheek weld is very important to have it adjustable. Okay. Now, the next step I look at is flexibility to the shooter, but there's also a practicality side of it, which is this bottom metal right here. And traditionally, I can feed rounds through through the receiver of the gun, or I can actually use what I'm used to using a lot of times, which is magazines. So what is your take on that, and, and what's the difference that, that you see as, as an instructor? Well, you know, as far as just the old, uh, floor plate on the bottom and where we could actually, you know, stack stack rounds through the, through the receiver, this actually is an upgrade. You know, we can run 10 round mags, and I can have two mags already preloaded in my pack. So this is actually much faster. You know, it, it's an upgrade, obviously. And it's one that I like, you know, as far as a hunting application, if you're out hunting in certain states, you can't have a 10 round mag, all right? Okay. Yeah, so you may have to stay with the five round mag, but I mean, that's not a problem. You can you can utilize whatever you need for, for your hunting or tactical world that you're wanting to get into. Now, when I order these stocks, I have an option sometimes. Do I get the Ford Picatinny rail? Do I not? How do I know whether I need that or not? There's so many options out there. Um, do, do I get, you know, regular uh, sling attachments? Do I go with flush cups? Um, what's your take on that? You know, personally, I like the flush cups. You know, I, that's to me, that's a great device. You know, it, it, it's a great tool. Uh, but, you know, when you really look at it, as far as the Ford Picatinny rail, obviously with a tactical environment you know if you've got night vision you want to hunt coyotes with night vision that that type of thing this is awesome you know okay. it's real nice to have you might want something that has more modularity uh because it, whether you're running like flare hisses or duns or a duns or you know pvs 22s or 27s whatever type of i squared device or thermal that you're actually utilizing you may require more of a footprint so sometimes you like the flexibility of something that has a full picatinny rail so it's it's one of those things that you have to look at. You know, this has the flush cups, which are very nice. Uh, it has a bottom metal 10 round mag, you know, adjustable cheek weld. This is a very nice semi hunting, semi, you know, tactical stock that a guy could go out and enjoy all aspects of shooting.
Now, is your decision of whether to get side flush cups um, or just a normal sling attachment going to be based on your method of carry? Not only that, but if you were to go out and stalk or carry a weapon, um, where would you recommend, say, a righty or a lefty mount these things? Because sometimes, you know, the, the, they'll tell you, hey, you can put them on left, right, all over the place. And it's like, hey, can you narrow it down for me just a yeah, little bit? Yeah, you know, and, and this is something that just with playing with and which everybody should do. I like having them ambi because I'll actually place it on the left side forward, but I actually run my sling around over to the back side. And if you think about the physics of it, when you actually mount that weapon system, if that flush cup is sitting right here and you tighten it up and you start to cinch down on it, the physics is wanting to lift out to where okay. the center of that flush cup is. So your stock is actually rising. What I like to do is actually wrap it over the stock and stick it on the right side. So as I start loading up, the physics of that strap coming over and under is keeping that line even so the gun cannot rise up. So that's a very good question. So on a stock like this, this would be more of a glass bed. Yeah, actually this probably would be glass bed. Most of the time if, you know, traditional hunting stocks, I mean they glass bed the whole stock, you know, so it'll be glass bedded all the way up. Now what we've started doing a lot now, they'll actually free float this. So the barrel's full, full free floated, but they're still going to glass bed the actual action which in a system like this, you're gonna to have to do. You know, personally, myself, I'd rather have, you know, just bed the pillar blocks and have a free floating, you know, stocks. Now, what, to the, to the shooter at home, to spend that extra money, what is the benefit of, of having it glass bed? And then not only that, but going the extra mile now and actually making it to where it's more of a free float system. You know, what you're gonna find is the harmonics and, and really the, the free floating, barrel is really taking over right now you know you don't have any problems with warping and that kind of deal with the stocks that we're using today's market so you know you take a weapon system like this where this is full free floated right here and I did not even glass bed the pillar blocks on this weapon system and it's super accurate you know I'd rather stay away from it. glass bedding is going to degrade over time so it's something I'm actually want to stay away from it's real controversial some people aren't, don't want to do that some people agree with it Personally, that's the way I like to run. You know, if you look at this weapon system here, you actually have the 2.0 folder from AI. And when you're talking about money from one stock to another, you know, most stocks are running six, seven, eight hundred dollars anyway. You know, and you can get this set up here for, you know, probably close to 900 just for the stock alone. And most of these stocks, correct me if I'm wrong, I mean, as long as you have general mechanics awareness, you can actually put this thing together yourself. Whereas on some of the fiberglass model stocks, you're actually gonna have to probably send that to a professional where Absolutely. they're gonna have to cut that out and, and actually work it, work your action and your barrel, everything into that particular stock if you want it done right, correct? Absolutely, you have to have a little bit of knowledge and skill to actually okay. do that other job, all right? Now, I had a buddy uh, down in South Texas that actually took a normal hunting style action and barrel, cut it off to 16 inches, that's what he wanted, stuck it in himself late that night. I went down there to give him a little, you know, hog hunting class, long range thing. He stuck it in there and it was a quarter minute gun the next day. He had to do a little bit of work, not anything technical, just had to do a little, modification to the stock where it fit nice, torqued it down, and it was ready to go. And it was in a stock just like this, so it's real compact, all right? You take a stock like this and set it in an Everly stock pack, totally disappears. So it's the ease of carry, carrying it in and out, you're not dragging, you know, as far as the tactical world, you're not seen as being, you know, one of the snipers in the bunch. You don't have this big barrel sticking out of the, your pack. You know, again, you have the full adjustability right here with your cheek weld, it's a folder. This is an excellent stock, you know, but what you're fixing to see is an upgrade from this stock, even though you have Ford Pictini rail here, to go ahead and grab that AX stock. Now this is something totally unique and brand new. This stock here, again, we had the Ford Pictini rail, but it's tubular design, is is very nice. And I really think most of us- It's very light as well, uh, I noticed. Super, super light. You know, and most of us, I think, will actually end up really liking this kind of stock. The Pictini rails are very modular. You can move them around any point that you want. It's very easy. You can drop a Remington action in it I right away. You can, you know, it has a length of pull. The comb's adjustable. Absolutely. Um, it also has a monopod on it. Um, what's your recommendation on running a monopod? Is it is it yeah, is it good to run it? You know. Personally, I don't like them. If I'm if I'm going to run one because I'm real high up in the back and I need a little bit more stability, I'll still put a sandbag underneath okay. it because the, the harmonics of this touching the ground 
you'll start to see some degradation of accuracy at long ranges, personally, at least myself. So I don't like running monopods unless they're touching to a sandbag. And you know, there's proper uses of using a sandbag as well. Okay. But this is a real nice stock. It's, it's very new. It has a cutout design yeah, here on the side. I was gonna ask you about that. Uh, I noticed that on this, this portion is cut out. I know on the normal guns, it's not. Um, I know for doing magazine changes, a lot of times I'm having to muzzle down, get the mag out, throw a new one in because they are a little long. Um, I take it on this, you don't even have to now. No, right now, I'm gonna lay this on your shoulder, but right now, if I'm sitting up taking a shot and I reach down and I actually drop that mag out, I can grab another mag and I don't have to lift the gun up to shove it in. I can just reach in here with a slight angle and just roll it in. Now this is a great new design. I was very happy to see somebody come up with something like this. It was actually one of those things we just overlooked in the community for years. It, great design. And this is a, a stock that I think is gonna sell somewhere around $1,300. So when you look at it, by the time you modify and glass bed and do everything that you're gonna do to those other actions, all right, and getting that set up, you could do it yourself You're not at home. Pay that much more, that much more money having something that's really nice like this. So, bottom line is, first customization is trying to get a more practical stock on your gun, because based on what we learned in class, everything that we talked about as far as trying to get you behind that gun, directly behind that gun, set up in the right position, the way you need to, based on your scope and the way your gear set up, these stocks allow you that flexibility that you need. Side folder, probably easy to get the bolt out, I imagine, the cleaner as well. I know on some of mine, I actually have to pull the whole cheek piece out just to get my bolt out. So, you know, having a side fold in stock is a huge benefit. So as far as the first upgrade, if I had just a little bit of money and I was trying to look at things, this would be a good way to go. Absolutely, you know, personally, I think the first upgrade that I would actually do is possibly upgrade my barrel. Okay. All right? and, but this would absolutely be within one of the first one or two. If I had a good barrel and it was shooting accurately, there's no need to really upgrade it. But this is a great stock, something that you can do yourself. And it's not really that expensive in comparison for the modularity that you get out of it. So now those are upgrades for the Remington 700. But I could actually buy from a manufacturer something that's already set up, kind of like this, this TRG. So from the factory, I've already got this stock built in. Everything's good to go. Um, I can actually move the rear piece right here. Yeah, this There's is just actually, a lot of options. You push in, it moves up and down very nice. You've got length of pull adjustments here. Your cheek weld, slide that up and down. All right, very quick without tools. That was the whole idea when we actually went and designed this, was we didn't want to have to use tools to get the adjustments that we needed. Also, it's a very nice folder, and the folders gives us the ability to not have to remove our cheek weld all right, to take the bolt out so we can actually clean the weapon. Plus, it conceals it. Portability. It makes it, portability makes it easier to pack in. Absolutely. Now, I guess the future is moving into, in regards to stocks, with everything that we talked about, is something like this Remington MSR right here, where I have a lot of modularity, adjustability, side folder, and this one also is multi-caliber, is that correct? Yeah, absolutely, it's, this is a state of art right now. This is something that I think that we're gonna see everybody start moving to a little bit more. Obviously, like a while ago when we was talking the different stocks, this one actually folds back over the bolt, which was a very neat design because now, if you're packing it in, it's slung over your back. You don't have a bolt sticking in the middle of your no, back. That's true. You know, or this sticking in the middle of your back. You can, it's more slimline, takes less, less space. All right, so if you look at it though, you've got the same adjustability here and here. So this is a really nice folder, all right? Everything's monolithic in the rail, meaning it's straight one line, it's on the same plane. You've got adjustability on, on your side Picatinny rails. It's a very nice system. You know, you have the ability to take off bipods like this and stow them, because when they're in the pack, this is the hardest thing to actually get out. So again, what we're looking at is modularity. Now with this system here, you can take out these two bolts and run about five off the top, slide this off, break that ring down and you can change the barrel out just like that. Then you change the bolt face. We can turn this 300 wind mag into a 338 Lapua in three and a half minutes. Wow. All right, and they are so accurate that you're not gonna be probably not more than three quarters of a mil off going from one caliber to the other. 
Now, as far as sticking my 338 barrel back on, it's going to be directly point A and point of impact. We, did, wow. we don't have any shift, all right? So I was actually amazed. I was really a skeptic at first. You know, every time somebody comes up with something kind of new, and as far as changing barrels, that's not really new. We've been doing that in the past with other weapon systems. But as far as when you're talking long range, 338 Lapua, you know, shooting out to 1,500 meters, out to a mile to 2,000, you can't give up any accuracy. That's the reason that you're using that type of system. So I was a little bit hesitant thinking that we could just slam the barrel back on, tighten it up, torque it down, put all the accessories back on, and it actually impacted the same spot. But when we actually tried it, we took it off, put it back on, took it off, put it back on, same point of impact. It shot the same minute of angle that the gun could shoot. So I was actually really amazed. And now you can actually get this with a 308. Really, you can get this with anything that you want as far as caliber now. So you, if you want a 308, 300 Win Mag, 338 Lapua, it's not a problem. So it's almost like a one gun fits all. Absolutely, and when you think about price, even though this weapon system's probably in the neighborhood of about $7,000, you know, when you look at, hey, for another $1,000, I can have a different caliber. So I don't have to buy another $4,000 rifle. All I have to do is spend, you know, maybe 1,000, 1,300. I don't know the exact price of the caliber change, but it's gonna to be to where it's actually really inexpensive comparatively to buying a new gun. A whole new gun and going through the whole entire process Absolutely. that we just talked about. You can get a 260 for competition shooting, you know, very good caliber, a 65 by 47, any one of the good calibers that are out there today. And as well, that chassis is actually gonna be available for your Remington 700 sitting in your closet right now. So at that point, we can take that, we can really supercharge that car very quickly if that's what we choose to go with as far as mod modularity and flexibility on that stock system. Absolutely. Now speaking about actions and barrels, I guess I wanted to talk a little bit about your, your normal stock Remington 700 action. So I wanna to try to make this thing a little bit better. In, uh, in a lot of readings and books, they talk about truing and blueprinting your action. What exactly is that? And then not only that, but what benefit am I going to get by, by sending my action off and having that done? And is it worth the money in your opinion? Yeah, you know, a lot of times the, the truing and blueprinting is actually making sure everything's true and straight, all right? so. When you actually pay money to get that done, and there's nothing wrong with that. that I mean, I have several at the house that were done that way, custom guns are very accurate rifles. But by the time you take the money to do that, you know, to your Remington 700, you can actually go out and go ahead and buy a custom action, something like a Surgeon, all right? So in my, in my mind, it's worth the money to go ahead and step up, you know, and do like you, talk, you were talking about earlier, go ahead and step up and buy that a little bit more expensive product, but it's a lot better. Plus resale, if you ever wanted to later on, is gonna be worth a lot more money. So what I have here is a rifle from Tactical Rifles and they've trued and blueprinted this. So what you're telling me is I should get a lot better accuracy out of this particular Absolutely. gun yeah. because they spent the time to do that. Absolutely. And now is that lining the bolt up more dead center with the barrel or, or I guess what is the factory not doing that this custom gun shop like Tactical Rifles is doing with their guns? Because I know their actions aren't aren't just trued and, and blueprinted, but I also know that they're very fast to move and manipulate. So I don't know if that's part of the process or if that's just a company spending a little bit of extra time, you know, putting a little bit more touch to it. Yeah, and I'm not a gunsmith, but you know, from what my gunsmiths actually tell me, they're, they're truing up the face of the bolt, all right? And they're truing up the face of the action where the barrel actually fits and comes in. So everything in that standard stock action isn't always necessarily true, you know, to where it's straight and in a line. That's where you get your accuracy, that with the barrel, all right? So with your chamber and everything that's done there. So when you look at it, it's worth spending the money to do it. You know, you don't have to. If you're going hunting with your Remington 700 that you bought stock somewhere at some gun store, you, no, nobody should tell you you have to do that. If it's a good, accurate gun, I've seen some super accurate rifles that weren't custom at all. But if you want to get the most out of the weapon system that you have, yeah, I, I would advise it very highly. Then these are all those little small things that start to add up to the bigger picture. Absolutely, you know, when you talk about you know shooting the distances that we've shot here, when you start talking about a minute of angle gun being good enough, in my opinion, that's not necessarily so. You know, when you're shooting out to you know 1,200 meters, out to 1,600 meters, you know, with a 308, if everything isn't really dead on, we're shooting half minute guns and sub half minute guns, and if you start shooting something that's a minute of angle, 
it's not going to be a minute of angle anymore once you get out to that distance. You know, theoretically and mathematically, you can say, well, if it's a minute at 100, it'll still be a minute at a grand. But somewhere in between, things just start to wall They start out. to get a little yeah. fatter. Now, if I want to spend the extra money, I can get something like this surge in action that's in this Nighthawk. So just kind of like going to the dealership, I guess, and, and do an immediate purchase on, on that Cobra. Cobra Mustang, and instead of yeah. trying to trick out my 5.0, I can just go right for the Cobra. Um, what what exactly is being done? Because you you had mentioned that hey, if I if, if I'm going to go out and and start looking at this very serious, instead of buying that Remington, sending it off to a gunsmith, having them work on it and manipulate it, I could just buy this thing right off the bat because I've spent all that money. I could have had this in the first place. So what exactly is this? Is, is this a factory product? Where exactly does this fall into? Yeah, Surgeon Actions is, in my opinion, is probably the best custom action on the market today. It has an integral rail. That rail is actually one piece into the system. It's not screwed on. So those four screws aren't gonna come loose on you because they aren't there, all right? So it, it's a real nice high-end, true doubt. It, it's, it's been, proven in competition it's been proven by tons of shooters that it actually shot it you know it's i'm not to say that other actions aren't good actions this is an action that we've actually tested and tried and, and it's actually worth the money when you actually start looking at the money that you're going to spend if you want to upgrade your remington 700 at home before you spend that money it's really a good idea to go ahead and talk to somebody like surgeon and compare prices before you just start spending money on the action you have at home at one time, you could actually have two guns instead of one and, and possibly not be out that much more money. Now, I noticed on a lot of these, um, at least a new, the, the flavor seems to be having, having more of an aggressive or fatter bolt. Yeah, the, we call them speed knobs, all right? But the, the way we manipulate the knob, you know, for speed shooting, you'll actually, as you squeeze the trigger, you'll lift the bolt with this finger and you run it back and then you'll slam it back home with your thumb and then your hand's already in position. So you can actually run that knob very fast. And that's something, you know, that with how much throw the bolt actually has. You know, some, some bolts are actually have more throw than others, which inhibit, you know, the speed side. So it, it's something, you know, we have straight action or straight bolt pulls uh, in some weapon systems. You know, you have some that are, you know, traditional with, a, with more throw on them. And it's something, that whatever you're wanting out of your system, you don't have to necessarily go out and spend the money to have a short throw. But it's, it's something, if you're going to spend the money, it's something that you might want to look at. Speaking of that, on this gun, I guess there's actually a different throw degree on here. And what's the benefit of that? Yeah, this is actually pretty short, you know, and, and it's really nice and really fast, like we talked about earlier. You know, and, and with this action, it's, it's a really smooth action. And, you know, the Saco action has always been one of the nicest actions, in my opinion, that you can buy off the shelf. Really, you don't have to do a lot of work to this, you know, and, and we've actually thought about building some custom guns on this action because it is such a nice, smooth action, and it's really fairly inexpensive. And then, of course, I guess we can go back to the MSR right here, and this one has, correct me if I'm wrong, an even shorter throw. Yeah, actually, it, it's deceiving. It doesn't look it, like it, but, you know, really, that bolt's pointing out here like this and only lifts that much. So it, this it really is a truly fast, fast action. The reason this is dip, dipped down so far is so that the stock will actually fold over. But you know, when you line up on it, you actually are able to pull, lift that up, and run it back pretty fast. So one, you can stay on target pretty quick. You can actually see your impact and, and run from there. Now I know that, you know, of course, we're talking long range, so speed is fine and accuracy is final. But if we have this particular system right here, then what we're looking at as far as bolt manipulation is maybe actually being able to manipulate and get a new round in there faster than we could have maybe before with a standard one, which means that I'm kind of weighing, I don't think I have enough time, I broke my shot, I need to see where that splash is, and I don't want to risk coming off by manipulating my bolt, so now I actually might be able to get away and then get a second shot on Absolutely. there faster. If, if I'm running something that has a shorter throw. You know, and, and we talked about it a little bit earlier about rapid bolt manipulation. You know, if I'm shooting something fairly close, I want to shoot, gain the knowledge that that bullet has to give me. As soon as, I, as soon as I see my impact, whether I miss or not, then I can run my bolt very fast and get back on target and send a second shot. However, when you have something like this that has more of a speed knob and a short throw and this weapon system being fairly fast other than it's a long action, the shorter actions obviously are a little bit faster. 
But when you have the option, if you're shooting out to 900 or even if, if you get good at running speed, you know, as, as far as bolt manipulation, you can actually take a shot at maybe 700 meters, take the shot, run the bolt fast, and be waiting to gain that knowledge of where your bullet's impacting. As soon as it impacts, we want to send the next round in the closest, in, or as close to the same environment as we did the first round. So I'm already set back up, looking, having my hold. Shooting in the same, you know, making your adjustment, shooting in that same wind you just broke that shot in, instead Absolutely. of waiting a, a few more seconds, as we saw, a few more seconds can change what's happening as far Especially as the environment. Especially out here goes. in this wind. <laughs> Awesome. So the next thing I want to talk about is, is barrels. Everything ranging from 308. I know traditional Marine Corps is 308 with a 24 inch barrel. I know that your standard wind mags range between anywhere, you know, 22 to 26 inches, possibly even with a 338. Um, I know that some barrels are, are thinner in profile, some are a lot heavier. So I guess what I'm looking for is some type of direction of how short does my barrel need to be based on the caliber in which I'm shooting and are are there any benefits to the longer barrels or shorter barrels or what is also going to happen? I know it's a lot of questions in one. What is also going to ha uh, happen by trimming my barrel profile down because I think like you had said earlier, the barrel selection is very, very important. So I'm getting ready to make this purchase, totally soup up this, this, this car that I've got now, and this barrel is, is, is a very important aspect of it. Do I go, you know, long barrel, short barrel, how thick do I make it? What's your take on that? All right, and, and I'll just give you a little background what I've been through, all right? Initially, I was the guy that wanted to shoot further, 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 so I was actually wanting to go longer, longer, longer with Makes my sense. barrel. But actually, what you find out, you know, you can hand load it to where you get full burn on your powder, even out on those longer barrels, all right? But what I actually realized uh, working, you know, through the problem and doing the testing, we started out with 338s with 27 inch barrels was normal for them. So we started out there and I started looking at portability and concealability. So started cutting back to 25 and 23 and 20 and 18 and actually shooting all of them. What I found was, you know, 18 was too short. I even think 18 is too short for a 308 bolt gun for what the, you want out of a bolt gun. And, you know, not saying that a 16 inch gas gun is too short, but for what you're actually buying a bolt gun for, in my opinion, 20 inches was the limit. Same with the 338. 20 inches actually gave me the most performance. Now, I, I don't, I can take off a little bit of the weight, but that wasn't really what I was looking at. What I was wanting to do was maybe even get a heavier barrel slightly, all right, to where I could actually have a more rigid barrel so the harmonics wouldn't affect me as much. And what I actually found was I have nearly zero impact shift with my Surefire cans and my groups at a mile was actually smaller than my 27 inch barrels. You know, my son shot that uh, five shot group at a mile at 15 inches and when he was 14 years old the first time, that gun I know with some other units in the military has actually shot when we were testing it, he shot a 19 inch group at 2000 meters. So I, kn I know that the short barrel systems, you know, at first everybody said, no, it won't work, Todd, you're losing too much muzzle velocity, blah, blah, blah. But you know, when we actually put it to the test, I'll never own another 338 over 20 inches. You know, if you're gonna shoot 20, or 23, some people look, hey, I might go kind of in the kind interim in at 23 or 25. If you're not gonna shoot a 20, personally, I'd go straight to the 27, and get everything that it could get out of it, you know? So I really like the shorter barrels, maybe possibly a little fatter, a little stiffer barrels, all right? So my harmonics are less. Now that's, it doesn't matter whether it's 308, 300 Win Mag, 338. Your, what you've found, the data that's, that you've seen is shorter barrel, stiffer barrel. A absolutely. Actually, we went from shorter barrels not only on our 308s and 300 wind mags at 20 inches and our 338s at 20 inches. So for whatever reason, that 20 inch just keeps coming back as a super accurate barrel length, you know, and as far as contour, you can do a lot of different things. You know, you can make, obviously, if you're going hunting with it and you're hiking all over Colorado or somewhere, you wouldn't want a real heavy barrel. But if you're in a more tactical environment or a, you know, a competition environment where you're looking at that pure precision, sure. that's something that you might want to go ahead and take on and carry with a little bit more extra weight. It's going to help in the recoil. It's going to help with harmonics. It's going to help with uh, impact shift when you put your suppressor on. Now, the, now the next subject that I'm going to bring up is, is more of a cosmetic to me, and that is fluting. Um, are there 
benefits that you see to fluting? I mean, as, as uh, above and beyond cosmetics. I mean, I can look at a, a gun that's fluted, or I forget what they call it when they've got that like twist going down the side. Yeah. All looks great, but is there a practicality side? Is there a positive or negative side to that? What's your take on that? That's a good argument because you're going to hear both sides from a lot of different people. Uh, fluting, you know, at first they say, well, it helps in the cooling because it gives you more surface area contact. But a lot of people that, you know, I highly respect have actually agreed that it doesn't give you any better cooling effect, you know, for your barrel. But as far as weight loss, yeah, it's a good, it's a good thing. You know, you have to be careful that the barrel has proper stress relief from the factory because once you remove that material, the barrel, if it has stress in it, actually may impact somewhere else, you know. So it may not be lined up, you know, and it may not be as accurate as it was prior to removing the, you know. And some people are real anal about actually taking any cuts off that barrel once it comes back from the factory. But, you know, for myself, I wouldn't have a problem with fluting. You know, I have a three, uh, fluted 300 wind mag. You know, it's a very good, very accurate barrel, and we actually stick it in that MSR and run it. Uh, myself, I'd rather go with shorter. All right, and then contour the barrel. I'm not a big flute person myself. You know, that's not something that personally I'm looking to do. So more practicality is, is your side of the house. Now that, that leads in, you mentioned contour. So it, you, had, you had said earlier that as long as I'm doing long range, if I'm worried about that really, really crisp precision shot, then the heavier barrel is the way to go. Is there a major loss in, you know, kind of tapering down that barrel? You know, what you're going to see is as the barrel heats up and you have that suppressor on it, or, you know, even if it doesn't have a suppressor on it and it's a thin barrel, that barrel's going to droop as it heats up, especially when you're shooting big calibers like a 338 Lapua. You know, uh, me and Eddie was out shooting a 338 that he had, a hunting type weapon system. And after the third shot at 1,200 meters, we were a half mil low. Oh, wow. So you know, it's so, already and then once it you cooled that down, fast. And it didn't take long to cool down because it was a thin profile. But once it cooled down, it was right back on track again. Now some people say yeah but all I need is you know one or two shots. Well obviously in a hunting situation really that's what you're hoping for you know is you may only have one or two shots and then you can make that adjustment. Obviously you can and that's the give and take that we have to look for in a lot of equipment choices when you go up you know and you're packing your weapon system and going up high. You know it, it depends do you want a shorter barrel that's a little bit fatter maybe the same you know weight as a longer barrel that's maybe you know, tapered down or fluted. So it's one of those things you're going to have to make up your mind for yourself. But personally, I like shorter barrels. I like stiffer barrels. You know, for hunting rifles, you kind of have to weigh, you know, what you want out of it. You know, personally, an eight, nine pound gun is a, is a really nice system, maybe even 10 pounds. But when you start sticking in a 338 Lapua, it's a lot of gun to try and hang on to. And really, it's not that it's that hard of a gun as far as kicking, you know, as recoil. But once you take that shot, you still need that knowledge of where that bullet hit. You need to call that shot for yourself. And with a super lightweight gun, it, sometimes the closer ranges, it's hard to actually you know, know where that bullet struck. So what we're looking at is, if I'm limited on funds, my question to you is, what are the first pieces that we've covered that you would have done to a gun? Um, and then of course, if I'm not limited to funds, and I, I have the funds available, I can just make a purchase. What would be your, your recommendation on things, to, a couple options to take a look at as far as, instead of spending you know, over a period of time, $3,000, hey, just take $4,000 and buy this. You know, the first thing I do is put a good trigger in your weapon. You know, a lot of people, and this is, again, it becomes controversial because I shoot a pound and a half trigger on all my guns. You know, that doesn't mean everybody needs to do that, you know, so, Depends on what you're doing. If you're tactical, as you know, you may not need a pound and a half trigger. You got other people around you constantly moving through rooms, doing the whole deal. Even if you're hunting with buddies and you don't feel comfortable with a pound and a half trigger, then you don't need one. You know, so for myself, for that pure precision, I think a nice, clean trigger break is is very important. And I want you know minimal probably two and a half pounds, and that's a good average number, two and a half, three pounds for most people, and and, and it's very safe. It's not a problem, and we have triggers that are that can be safe at that light weight. So that's the first thing I do. The second thing I do is if your gun isn't accurate, I'd replace the barrel, and if it is accurate, then I would upgrade you know to some of the stocks that we've actually looked at to give you that modularity and some of the other options that we've seen. All right, awesome. All Thanks. Right. That's really good knowledge, yeah. man.
All right, Todd, when most people think precision or, or hear the word precision rifle, you typically think of the, the bolt gun. Um, but with today's guns, uh, with these gas guns that are coming out nowadays, um, they're pretty competitive. And I'm finding that some of these gas guns that like specifically some of these we've been running this week are way more accurate than some of my bolt guns. Yeah, you know, it's really amazing. Uh, when you think gas guns, we initially think like the M14. And then we moved into the SPRs and the SR25s and, and those types of systems. And really, we kind of accepted that the accuracy was really going to be probably somewhere around a minute, minute and a half. But the reality is now systems like the OBR, you know, and, and I wouldn't have actually thought this. I was actually a skeptic too when, you know, people are telling me the accuracy that they initially were starting to get out of them. And, you know, and I was shooting one from day one and it was a very accurate system. You know, mine was a half a minute gun, but the further we go on, the better they get. When I was building my nomogram or the whiz wheel, I needed a good algorithm, so we went out and was doing some testing. I had my surgeon rifles, and I just got in my 20-inch OBR, so I just carried it out just to play with it, to get a little time on it while we were out there shooting. And what I found was, at th that day, with that ammo, that gun was really one of the most accurate guns that I owned, to the point that when we started doing testing, it shot a four-inch group at 800 meters. We are big advocators of what works, um, and you said it perfect, man, when um, you know, you got a boy that's that's about to go in the military possibly, and I've got a 12-year-old son that he's already talking about going in the military, and what kind of people will we be if we advocate a kit that didn't work? Absolutely. Um, and so that's where I'm in the same school of thought as you, and um, I tell you that I, I am I'm shocked about how, how, how this gun has performed and since I've been using this. Um, I mean, you, shooting an eight-inch group the other day at 1,200 yards, I would never, never imagine that. Shooting this thing out to a mile, I would never imagine that. Um, and it's an auto gun. It's magazine fed. I can actually be more confident um, clearing a room with it if I had to because there's many times where we would have to carry bolt guns in, in country overseas and we're going through a 10-story building trying to get to a position with four or five rounds in a gun and no side optics, no nothing. But now, I mean, the way they're building these things, um, you know, putting that metal into certain places uh, to make the tolerances a hell of a lot tighter. So, you know, it, it just says accuracy. Yeah, absolutely. You know, the collapsibility of these systems, you can nearly do anything. And that's the neat thing about gas guns. You know, for the boys that are working downrange, they can keep it in the car with them. It's short, it's compact. Sure. You know, a lot of guys ask me, you know, what do I need to buy? 16 and 18 and 20 inch. And, you know, I was a big fan. A gas gun is a gas gun, so make it short. You know, to keep it legal, run a 16 inch gun, you know, as far as legal here in the United States with us. So, sure. you know, I like the 16 inch gun. I think a gas gun is made to be a 16 inch gun. That was what I thought. But really, when you start looking at it, the 20, the 18, the 16, it really doesn't matter. We've shot all three of them out to a mile. Out so a it's mile. just, yeah. you know, what you're really looking for. What kind of muzzle velocity are you wanting? You know, with the 16s, we're getting around 2,500 feet per second. The 18s right at 2,550, and then the 20 inch models are getting right at uh, 2,600 to 2,620. So, you know, we're really not losing that much anymore with the gas guns. And they're, they're amazing uh, weapon systems. You know, there's Picatinny rails, we, they're very modular. We can put rails wherever we want. We've seen a great progression, you know, from even the Barrett. You know, this the M107 is a great weapon system. Uh, I've actually shot that weapon system out to 4,889 meters up in Utah. You know, a lot of people say, well, it's a three or four inch gun. Maybe at 100 it is, all right? But that's not made to be shot at 100 meters. That's, that's not true. what that yeah. weapon system was made for. We, you know, with the Rafa's Mark 211 that we shoot, you know, in training, that gun is a minute and a half gun at a mile, you know? So, you know, that's consistently what we see with the, with the guys shooting it, you know? Depending on guy to guy, it may be two minutes for one guy, but you know, for what it's designed for, it's hard to actually beat that weapon system. No, I find the same thing when I'm shooting close and shooting far, I, my groups are much more accurate out there and that's, that explains why. What do you think about 5.56 SPRs? I know there's a lot of 5.56 in circulation out there. I've used 5.56 SPRs in combat and, and um, you know, they work. Yeah, I think they're great weapon systems. You know, they're lightweight and can carry lots of ammo with it. You know, so it's it's one of those things, you know, just like we're talking about bolt guns and gas guns and different types of optics that we can use on each one of them, you know, really what it comes down to, it's a different tool. It's a different tool for the job. You know, if you're going long range as far as 
in the movement, you know, and covering lots of area, and you may be going to, uh, into a hot zone where you need a lot of ammo. And, and I don't try to tell the guys, you know, my opinion of anything that I train as far as what they should do tactically. I keep my mouth shut. They're, they're big boys, they know what they're doing. My deal is, Everything is a tool, whether it's an optic, whether it's a ch uh, caliber choice, you know. But like, you know, for your question, I love the SPR. I think it's a great weapon system. You know, for the job it was meant for, it's hard to beat. And I'm, I'm not a big fan of moving away from 5.56. Five, I look at the bullet, whether it's, you know, green tip or Mark 262 in the 77 grain, I look at each one of those as different tools. You don't use a 5.8 wrench to actually overhaul your motor. You know, you're going to have to have a, you know, a lot of different tools yeah. to do the job. And I wouldn't move to 6.8, you know, personally. I wouldn't, I'm not looking for a different caliber. Maybe different types of bullets that are already currently in the system that can do the job better. You know, I, I, like, I like looking at the tools that we use. With this weapon system here, when the guys come in, a lot of times we'll do a sniper class slash carbine class. And my carbine class is not square by stuff. I mean, y'all do a great job with that malfunction drills, the whole deal. My carbine class starts at 200 and goes to 800 with that type of weapon That's system. awesome. Yeah, and then like when I was in Iraq, when using the SPR version, and a lot of people asked me, well, don't you wish you had a 308? And I'm like, uh, you know, looking back on that, no, I don't. I'm, I'm glad I had that because, you know, I was pushing out the targets at 700 plus meters, and um, and I was shocked that I was hitting. And and now that I look back, I'm, I'm just, surprised that I'm shocked that I was shocked <laughs> yeah. you know what I mean so um, especially with some of these new weapons coming out that's like you said it's at my end of the world gun is, is yep. probably five five six yeah you know, you know we, we laugh and we sit around at night and we talk with every group that comes through you know what's your end of the world gun and you know people go oh he's paranoid you know he's you know <laughs> he, he's losing his brain but my deal is you know being prepared is a lot better than waking up one day going oh wow the lights are out you know and you look at what happened in New Orleans and that kind of deal now 308 is a great gun but, well, it, but it takes heavy ammo and you know you can do a lot more and carry a lot more ammo with the 556 so as far as if I had to buy one gun I'm not for sure it wouldn't be something just like that. Well people need to realize too I mean we're probably way off topic but terror and, and chaos is a statistic of history so it's it's um it's something everybody needs to think about. Absolutely. We got a lot of tactical-ish you know weapon systems here um, I mean I still use these these for hunting and everything that I do but what other kind of systems are out there um, you know for the competitive side I'm not big into the precision for competitive side I know you've done a lot of com competitions but I know there's some great manufacturers out there making some good stuff and, and we will talk about those as well yeah you have weapons like uh, JP a great competitive gun very accurate you know and HK on the tactical side you know that's, that's another very good weapon system you know the neat thing about ARs is it's kind of like that do it yourself, you know, in your garage. You can actually take and buy all the components and put it together and be your own gunsmith, which is kind of fun if you're kind of tuned to go that way. It's, it's your own personal design, you know, and you can do a lot with it. And there's a lot of different mods that you can actually buy and accessorize your weapon system. You know, but you, if you look at weapon systems like this as compared to bolt guns, what you really think about is price, you know, being the initial deal, you know, you, whether it's a four or five thousand dollar custom gun and up or you look at a gun like this it's honestly m may be just as accurate but this is only three thousand dollars yeah half the price sometimes and i'm not knocking whether you buy a bolt gun or a gas gun because they to me they're they're different tools you know but there is it's just one of those deals that some people may not have the money to buy a bolt gun so this may actually fit their need now that they are as accurate as they are could a gas gun be as accurate as a bolt gun? I didn't think so. Now I believe it because I see it. You know, Todd, one thing coming from a big hunting background, I look for accessories that are either going to offer me portability and stability but also light, lightweight. We, we understand that in a hunting, law enforcement, or military community, that ounces equal pounds, pounds equals pain. We've heard that saying a lot. Uh, so, so one of the things that I look for to give me good support and stability in the field for any of my systems that I'm running, be it bipods, shooting sticks, or even my packs. Yeah, and I tell you what, you know, talking about that, the stability portion, one of the big deals that we kind of look at is whether we shoot with a shooting glove or a rear bag. And the reason we make the rear bags like this, you know, when I started getting around a lot of shooters, I noticed that the rear bag was a sock filled with sand. It was this big and it was real tight. So 
there wasn't a lot of modularity with it. You had this or you had this and that was it. But you know, with something like this, you can fold it in half, all right? So you can get a lot of stability here. You can actually cut it off and take a pinch of it, or you can shake it down and squeeze it up and get real high. So there's a lot of uses for this. Now, starting from the ground up, you've got something like this, the uh, LaRue quick detachable bipod, but this is a six and nine swivel and the swivel is very important. A lot of people actually run out and buy the other style that doesn't swivel because they really don't understand what they need and what you're going to end up finding out. You have to go down there and loosen it up, lift it up, let it fall back down, check see if it's level because if you're not level, you're missing a lot of long range. That was a huge factor for me in a big eye opener out here was just the actual cant on, on the weapon system out to distance and it really made a difference in hits or misses. Yeah, absolutely. You know, in the next one, let, hand me those hunting bipods. Now this is a Harris bipod as well, just like the LaRue is, which this is just a Harris with some mods on it. But you know, you can take this and actually get some stability because you know, both of us from the hunting background, you know, you don't get to lay prone every time you take a shot. <laughs> That's for so, sure. So something like this is actually very nice and it's something that we're actually continuing on and we're actually uh, creating mods for so that we can actually stick stuff on that actually gives us more height very quickly. All right, but this is actually a very good piece of kit. It's not that heavy, but again, like you talked about, you know, it is heavy enough that you may want to make a decision. You know, when you actually look at something like this, all right, one of these two, go ahead and open those up. You know, these are really nice. These are lightweight. Like I said, I carried these to Alaska this is really nice. It's lightweight, gives you really good stability. Like you said, you can use them for tent poles, all right? So something like that has a little bit more rigidity and really you could carry both these because they're very lightweight and they're very useful. And you know, and our next step is going to something like this where it's actually a, a tripod and you, you can get some adjustability. You can actually stand this one up fairly tall. You know, and this is something that you can use. It's, you know, pretty modular as far as the height that we can work with. And as you see, this flows right into this, which actually you can mount your weapon system onto. Well, what I found that was really unique uh, was the fact of using the tripod as well as the shooting sticks together in a tandem roll, which actually created a really stable platform when loading it, which really enabled us to make shots at extended distances that you would never really honestly try before offhand or even just support it on a, on a bag somewhere over a rock outcropping. Right, and you're exactly right. You know, and the one thing that you talked about, with, oh, you've got to make a choice between all these. You can shoot off your pack as well. The, like we said, this is still pretty low to the ground though. You know, this is something that you're gonna have to pick in between when you go hunting. You know, but when you look at packs, this is a very nice pack. It's Glenn Aberly's pack. I can actually take my folding stock right out of it. You know, so this is a very nice system as far as a pack that actually conceals the gun very nicely. Even though if I'm not looking to conceal it, it has a top cover on it to where I can keep the rain off my weapon system. So this is a very nice pack. It has a lot of different features as far as uh, pockets and different design features. It's uh, the Phantom pack, but I see you have another pack with you today. What is that? This is the pack from Arc'teryx, which is their Halo pack. What's really nice about it, it's covered in molly. It gives us a lot of adaptability. The one thing that I do like about this is one of the features that I've added to this pack is from Gene at High Speed Gear out of North Carolina is their Mars. And what this does, this is allows the full coverage of the muzzle to the buttstock, folds right up, snap it in, and I'm all set. That's really nice. Very simplistic design. It's very functional. Yeah. The, the other thing that we've done too is uh, added uh, High Speed Gear's new taco pouches. So if you're in a mission adaptable world, such as a law enforcement setting, military, and you're changing calibers, or even in a hunting situation, I can go from a 5.56 magazine right to a, a PMAG 20 LR even to a 10 round hunting magazine for one of the other uh, precision guns. That's very nice. Very low profile and it really serves a lot of purpose. It allows you to change from one set of kit without spending a lot of money and have it perform multifunctional roles. You know, really what you have to do is look at what you're doing. If you're going on a hunt, you have to decide how much weight you can actually carry. So you're gonna have to decide whether you like the little sticks, little bipods. Look at your area that you're going into. Does it have high grass? Can you get up on top of a high hill? So this is just a, very small taste of what's out there and available to the public. Yeah, there really is a lot available and it's up to the user really to decide what their mission is and what's driving their gear choices. Absolutely. You know, Mike, a lot of the guys that actually come to the class wonder what kind of optic they should put on their own on weapon system at home. What's your preference? What do you use? Depends on what I'm doing. 
Uh, the optic is, uh, you know, obviously the, probably the most important link between the shooter and the target. And, and obviously with what we learned this week, uh, some of these, these more discriminating reticles, having that higher power isn't something we used to do. And, you know, I used to think, you know, 10 power is about as much glass as I wanted to have on any rifle. But I, You know, they used to say that, you know, one power per every 100 yards or meters sure. was all you needed. And, and maybe in the past uh, that was acceptable, but in, in my world and what we're doing, pushing out at long range, if I can see better, I can shoot better. So I want all the power I can get. You know, we have everything here from one to eights, which is, is actually a very good scope. But you know, when people look at one to eights, they say, well, hey, I can go from a one power all the way to eight power. You know, even in a hunting environment, if you're hunting in the woods and you're not taking shots past 300, there's nothing wrong with something like this. And this actually has the H58 reticle in it. But it's, it, again, it's not something personally that I would want to utilize going through a house because I don't want to look through a tube. You know, if I had something like this and was actually running even as a secondary, the T1 that's mounted up on the system like this off at a 45, you know, you can have it up and roll it over very quickly with both eyes open. And whether you're going through a house or just shooting a fast mover very quickly, you know, you don't have to wait and try to find him through that tube. For sure. I mean, that prairie dog pops up at seven yards and yep. you need to get on him quick. That's Absolutely. So, you know, going from one to eight, and like you talked about, something like a uh, possibly a two and a half to 10 or or a three to nine, something that's more of a hunting type variety. You know, personally, I'm a big fan of power. I want more power. And, you know, the common misconception is that, you know, hey, too much power, the mirage is gonna blow you out, you can't utilize it. And well, I found way, we, we could actually see through the mirage better with, with the higher power. Yeah, and what I try to tell the guys, mirage is your friend. Mirage is telling you what's happening downrange. You know, when we were dealing with the 10 power scopes, you know, in, in, in my line of work doing training, what we found was that the kids that had the 10 power scopes on, they'd look down range and they couldn't see the mirage change. They couldn't see that wind change, you know, right before they broke the shot. But the guys that were actually running, you know, something like this, a six and a half to 20 from Leopold, or, you know, Horse Vision's five to 20 power, when they had more power, they could actually see that change, you know, and they were all like, hey man, wind's changing, now they're holding center, you know, if it started to bull or something, where the 10 power, we couldn't see the mirage. So, I'm a huge fan of power. I think it's it's a big bonus for us. You know, we have probably the biggest problem once we start increasing our power is the size of the optic. You know, we have everything here from a small one to eight, and you know, we have the Zeiss there. Go ahead and hold that up. This is a Zeiss, you know, four to 16, and one of the big benefits about the Zeiss is it's very short. And what you're gonna see here in the very near future, you know, you look at something like the 5 to 25 Smith, which is a longer scope, but a, a magnificent scope. You know, the problem with it is, again, it's a large scope, you know, and I'm not concerned that much about the weight of my optic, especially when it's that kind of quality. But what I'm more concerned with is what kind of footprint I still have left for my night vision out in front of that weapons or sure. in front of that scope. These longer optics are eating up a lot of real estate, I mean, especially with a weapon system, you know, like the Polk gun here, this, we're just dealing with uh, with an optic mount right here over the action and not having that continuous monolithic rail you got to think about that oh absolutely so you know once you start you know even on a weapon system like this where you just have a small amount of uh, of rail space still available you know that's something that you have to start thinking about so what some companies are doing they're actually trying to decrease the size of their optics at least in the overall length this is a 4 to 16 and you can actually see you know it's it's maybe an inch shorter then that one, you know, in the 5 to 25, but now Smith has a 3 to 20 power that's actually an inch shorter than the 4 to 16. So again, we're getting that maximum power. And what I've actually seen, you know, working through different power ranges all the time, different scope companies bringing stuff out, the 16 power I thought was a the kind of more all around good power. But what I've actually found now, you know, when we started working with the 5 to 20s in this, in this Falcon from Horse Vision, the 20 power, I found that I stayed on 20 power all the time and I didn't have a problem. I wasn't dialing back down. And at 25 power, every now and then you may dial back down if the mirage is horrible as it can be out here sometimes. But the 20 power seems to be kind of optimal. Smith Mender has actually developed a 3 to 20 power, which you know I personally believed is the all around scope because we still have that 3 power for you know big field of view when you're dealing with something sure. up close. I mean, it's great to be able to have that, that, that power ring to sometimes you don't know if you're in the position the right way and you need to need to back off that, that power for a second to locate your target, reassess your position, adjust that bag and then okay now we're going to start settling in before we adjust parallax which 
um, brings us into a couple of a couple of different ways of doing that. I mean, we've we've got these these parallax adjustment knobs here on the side, um, sometimes referred to as a side focus knob, and then yep. actually uh, a, a large piece that's uh, on the objective. Uh, what do you look for in that uh, in that capacity? You know, a lot of times it depends on our barrel profile on whether you can run a 56, you know, or you may actually may need a 50 millimeter objective. That's something that you're going to have to look at when you set it up or look at the mounting system that you actually put on the scope. All right, but you know, when, when I'm looking at it, I want a very, you know, nice ocular focus adjustment. So again, we talked about this uh, initially when, when you're setting up scopes. That's one of the biggest things that I see that people don't do correctly is actually fix a parallax on their scope. So once you've actually set the ocular focus to where the reticle is super, super crisp and being type A personalities, a lot of times we blow right past that, you know, so it, it, we get it close to where we can kind of see it, but it's not perfect. And then we set the, like you said, the, the target focus over here, what is commonly called as the parallax, but the, the side focus on the side for the target. So once the target is very sharp, then we'll move our head up and down to make sure there is absolutely zero movement. If there is movement, then we go back, readjust this slightly, refocus here on the side focus, again, until that line does not move off what we're aiming at. So it, it's something, it's a lot of scopes are a lot, are real different from, you know, Leopold's where you may have to turn this, you know, a couple of revolutions around. So don't be afraid to actually go ahead and play with it and move it around because I've had some people think that, hey, you know, I, I can't get this fixed. And it was just, we had to rotate it several rotations before we could actually get it on. Once you pretty much get this ocular adjusted and set, do you ever find yourself making any changes on it? You know, I really don't, uh, from person to person, you know, and really, I'll be honest, most of the time, and I thought I have 2010 vision or grew up with 2010 vision and as I'm getting older, that's starting to go away. So I, I need reading glasses up close, but actually in my job, it, it's become a benefit because I can't see very well up close anymore as far as reading. So when I get down behind my student's rifles, I look through and I'm like, oh wow, how can he see that? And so I'm changing his actual, you know, ocular focus to make that reticle super crisp because his younger eyes actually blow right past it and fix it. You know, they'll actually, you know, focus on that reticle even though that it, that it is out of focus. So since my eyes won't adjust that quickly, I, have to, I can set it for him and say, hey, try that. And he looks like, yeah, man, that's, that's a little better. His eyes were just, you know, focusing on it very quickly and adjusting for it. So, you know, if you have good young eyes, you know, like yourself, go ahead and look outside, focus somewhere else and look right back in the, re in the reticle. So if that reticle starts out blurry and then becomes sharp, that's something that you actually need to go ahead and make that adjustment. And if you're, if you're moving your head and you see that line separate from your target that you're aiming at, that, then you know you actually still have parallax and that's what you need to fix. But, you know, as we get older, maybe there are some benefits. We got a lot of nice, uh, a lot of nice optics here on the table. Um, let's, let's talk about some of the adjustments some of these scopes have. Um, we've got everything from quarter minute elevation turrets here to 0.1 mil rad to the Zeiss here with uh, one centimeter at 100 meters. Yeah, you know, you, working with the military guys, you know, the M3 Alphas on the M24s are have one minute clicks. So every click equals one minute of angle. It's not right? a very fine adjustment. That's not a very fine adjustment for a precision rifle, exactly. Uh, this one here actually has quarter minute clicks, which that's a very nice system. The problem with, with that type of system, as far as I'm concerned, is why am I looking at a mill system inside my scope, being the reticle, and dialing in minutes of angle? Now, I, I know that's old school, and that's the way that it's been done forever, but you're starting to see a big trend to scopes like this, which are actually 10th mil corrections. It equals the amount of measurements that I'm looking at in my scope, which actually makes more sense. And it's, you know, people look at it and they go, well, I, I don't understand what a mil is or, you know, uh, a centimeter. You know, I, I was the same way, you know, being a, a country boy from West Texas, I didn't know a mill from a millipede, you know. So basically when I started shooting with, you know, utilizing mill dots and mill corrections, it really came to you very quickly. It, it's really sure. intuitive. So it's not something that people have to get outside their comfort zone and try, you know, if they look at it once and, and try to play with it, very quickly it's going to pick up. Do you see any benefit whatsoever to staying with a system you know, quarter and a half minute turrets. No, a actually, uh, the quarter minute turrets are fine. I like the mill turrets better, personally. Uh, obviously, there's going to be a lot of people that already have minute of angle 
or a quarter minute or half minute or whatever they may have. You know, and there's some good scopes. Leopold makes a lot of good scopes with uh, half minute corrections left and right, you know. And e even the M3LRs, you know, or M3 Alphas that were one minute corrections, they have half minute corrections on their windage. You know, a lot of times we actually hold wind. I'd, I'd rather have it reversed. I'd rather have half minute on my elevation and one minute on my windage. But, you know, the problem is you're going to have, when you do have a one minute correction on your elevation turret, you're either going to be a high shooter or a low shooter most of the time, meaning that I can't get it actually really zeroed, that my bullet's either going to strike just below my crosshair or just above my crosshair. And personally, I always want my bullet to hit on top of my crosshair if I can't get it, you know, dialed in correctly. But it, it's something, you know, I, I think you're going to see a big movement towards just having meals as far as turret goes and, and really be aware. a little bit of math. Absolutely. Really be aware, you know, when you start buying scopes, how the how the clicks feel because that's that's the big difference that you're paying for when you actually look at buying scopes you know right here we had the 5 to 20 horse vision which basically as far as the glass goes is excellent you know and it has a horse reticle that comes with it and this scope sells for about fifteen hundred dollars where when you start looking at scopes like the smith mender scope this may actually sell for closer to you know twenty seven hundred to three thousand dollars with the h58 reticle in it but that's one of the things that you're looking at. What you're paying the extra money for is actually the mechanical adjustment being super correct. So when you actually calibrate that scope, you're gonna aim at the, that little box at the bottom of the, of the cat's target. And then as you dial 10 mils, you're gonna see that bullet impact, you know, 10 mils high, hopefully. All right, so, and then you'll go ahead and dial another 10 mils up and see that bullet impact at 20 mils high. A lot of times your scope may not have that adjustment, but you can actually go up one mil, two mil, three mil, and actually see where that separation is and see if it's calibrated or not. You know, and not every scope will be calibrated, so it's something that you really need to know if you're dialing. You know, that was one of the huge advantages of the horse reticles was we don't have to dial with them. You still can, that's one of the things, the misconceptions, well, it's a horse reticle, so I, I still like to dial. But nothing takes that away from you. It's still a you know a good quality scope. You can still dial if you want to, but you don't have to all the time. So by skipping using a, a, a mechanical man-made mechanism with the reticle, you, you feel like we're gonna get a, a, a finer adjustment by just holding off using that horse reticle. A absolutely, you know, when you look at mechanical man-made clicks, uh, even though companies do a very good job most of the time, you know, the quality companies in, in making those clicks be accurate. Uh, what we're finding is even with, when I use a horse reticle at the distances that we've been shooting this week, when you dial, you know, you're looking at shooting at, uh, it, it could be as, as close as 1,285 meters and we're holding 20 mils, I may want to dial 10 and hold 10. And there's nothing wrong with that if you're shooting a scope that's capable of being accurate. So what you're paying for in one of these higher quality optics, in, in addition to the glass, you're getting a mechanism you can rely on. Absolutely, absolutely. But, you know, everybody at home can afford a $3,000 scope, you know, and that's one of the deals that's like, you know, we kind of talked about earlier. How many rifles do you have at home? Do you have five, six, seven rifles? How many scopes do you have? Most people put a scope on every rifle. And instead of having maybe a four or $500 optic on that weapon system, maybe you could sell all your scopes, get a quality optic and utilize that one scope on everything. So you're shooting the best glass available and you're still shooting it on all your weapon systems, you know, and, and some people had rather have scopes on everything but personally, I'd rather have super glass, you know, really high quality glass and enjoy it on every weapon system that I own. And if you're gonna spend that kind of money and, and actually really get a nice high quality piece of glass, you really wanna take care of it. So what we have here is the Tenebrax scope cap covers. You know, this is nice soft rubber, all right? It has a nice detent in it to where it snaps, holds really nice and secure. This thing isn't gonna be popping off. As you can see there, it pops on real nice, but this thing actually lays back pretty flat. You're not gonna break these things from what I've actually played with them. So these things are really nice. You can see how flat they fold back so they're not sticking up in the air like this. But this is actually something that you need to think about if you're actually buying, you know, really any type of glass. You'd, you'd wanna make sure you take care of it and having good scope cap covers is something you need to look at. Okay, so I think a lot, another feature that a lot of people look for in a scope is illumination of that reticle. What, what are your thoughts on that? You know, when it comes to illumination, you know, I, I grew up hunting and we didn't have illuminated reticles. And, you know, the people will tell you, you know, there's 15 minutes, you know, 
prior to sunrise and 15 minutes right at sunset or right after sunset that you're going to lose that reticle and you can't see it. And really, you know, going out and shooting a lot at those times, it's really a period of about three to five minutes. And, you know, in a tactical world, there'd be no reason, you know, why you'd want to, you know, start something at that period without already having, you know, that, that night vision on. So if you're hunting and you're, you don't have night vision, you know, illuminated reticle, there's really nothing wrong with it. You know, I don't see that much advantage in having illumination personally. Uh, it, it's something a lot of people like. It's one of those things, uh, some people want it, some people don't. It, you can save a little bit of cost not having it. And to be honest, it's, uh, it's one of those things, some people like it, some people don't care about it. You know, I'm, I'm kind of stuck in the middle. There's times I've had illuminated reticles now for the past seven years, you know, and running them every day pretty hard. And to be honest, you know, as far as going out and hunting with them, I've only actually lit them up twice in the past seven years. So we don't use illuminated reticles very much, at least in the line of work uh, in my training that we do. Let's talk a little bit about how we're going to get this optic on, on the weapon system. Yeah, and that's one of those things that you really have to kind of be careful about because there's a lot of rings out there that you have to take time in lap because the surface areas won't match up with your scope and you're only gripping the very tip of your scope or the very back of your scope in, the, in those rings. So, you know, it's again, that's one of those things that you're attaching a $3,000 potentially piece of glass to your four or $5,000 weapon. It doesn't have to be that way. It could be a $600 scope on your $800 rifle at home, but you're still going on your deer hunt and you don't want to miss a deer because your mounting system, you know, the interface there. So again, it's something that you really need to take time and, you know, do some studying. And personally, I prefer the LaRue Quick Detach system, you know, and it's pretty controversial. A lot of people don't like levers. They don't think it's a real secure hold. You know, but I've actually done testing to where we actually, you know, took and locked this in to a Picatinny rail, all right? And then once we actually locked it in and took, uh, aimed at a target and actually dialed a crosshair, you know, to where it was perfect, and then took it off, once we locked in like this, you could actually see your crosshairs were off the target, but once you, you know, activated that camming system, once it cammed in, the crosshairs settled right back perfect every time. So I went out and shot it, you know, I'd shot it previously before we actually set it up and run it on a, on a camera and sat there and watched it uh, align itself back up every time. In shooting it, I'd taken it off, put it back on, shoot, take it off, put it back on, shoot. And I'd done that over a hundred shots. And really what I found was the gun was maintaining the minute of accuracy that the gun was able to actually maintain. So I was actually, you know, really shocked at how well they actually really do hold accuracy taking it off and putting it back on you know and this is something again that you can use with different multiple or multiple different weapon systems you know whether it's a ar style platform or a bolt gun as long as it has a 1913 standard picatinny rail and as you'll remember when we actually change scopes from you know past past your scope to the right drill we actually you know travis had his scope with these levers and when we gave it back to him to re-zero his gun, he just put it back on, shot his same dope on the targets that were downrange and was immediately back on target, you know? So another thing that we actually need to cover though is actually torquing all this down. Now, again, when we start doing our levers, you need to have these contact at about 45 to 60 degrees, like right there, right when they make contact. Personally, I like mine pretty tight. So really, I want this at about 60 degrees when they make contact. All right, once you do that, you lock in the back. All right, now this one is actually set up right now on a different 1913 standard Picatinny rail, which means they're not all standard because that one's a little bit loose. All right, but then we actually need to take and torque these down. Personally, I'll actually torque them down to probably 20 to 25 pounds, depending on what I'm using. But 20 pounds is, is a good torque to actually do that with. Now, another system that you can actually utilize or what a lot of people actually have is something similar to what we have here, whether it's Night Force or Badger or whoever. And this system here, you know, you're gonna have to torque these down. You know, you can get a wrench, it is a 65 inch pound torque wrench, but what most people do, they just run up here and snap them over. And that's something that really I kinda teach against. What I like to do is, you know, if you wanna make sure it pops twice, that's fine. But on that last time, just turn it barely right before it snaps, then let off. We know we already actually have the torque on it, but what I don't want it to do is reverberate. I don't want it to hit and 
come off a little bit. So that way I don't end up with one ring torqued down to 65 and one torqued down to 62 and a half. A absolutely. So once you hear that snap, then the next one's just bring it over till it starts to snap. And you can actually feel it, you know, starting to roll loose from that cam and then come back down. Imagine that gets pretty important. The calibers like 338 Lapua and even some of the 300 wind mags without a, uh, a can on it. Um, that recoil could probably you know, back those bolts off to where you're getting a shift in zero. Yeah, unfortunately, we've, we have seen that a lot. And like you're talking about, even with the larger calibers, as much as we shoot with the 308, you know, two, 300 rounds a day, we actually have them actually slip off, you know, a couple of times this year. So it's something that you have to check. I would advise probably every day, you know, go ahead and snap them in. You know, something that we have to be aware of, when we're taking off our scope and putting it back on, you can't just place it anywhere on that rail system and it maintain, you know, it's zero. So what most people do, they'll actually mark their rail somewhere or you can put these index clips on, all right? Once you put the index clips on, then you know that you can actually push it forward to that one spot, you know, and sometimes guys will put them behind and in front and you know exactly where you were at. So those are nice little pieces of gear that you can actually have to remind you exactly if you do take your scope off where to put it back to. So bottom line, if I'm going to be investing in a weapon system like, like some of these here, it, it really isn't doing its service unless I'm putting a good quality piece of glass on it. I mean, if, if I've got a gun that I've spent the money on that, that has that quarter minute capability, I'm not really going to be able to extract that capability with, uh, with a, a subpar piece of glass. Absolutely. You know, and there's, there's a lot of different things that you can look at when you're buying glass from, you know, illumination to power to nice, you know, uh, parallax. But one thing, you know, that you really got to be aware of is this is just a small smidgen of what's on the market. You know, there's a lot of good companies that make a lot of good optics. You know, there's a lot of different reticle choices out there. Educate yourself, you know, understand what you're looking for. And then whatever money that you can spend, this is something I wouldn't skimp on. This is probably more important to me than, you know, most rifles that we can buy even off the shelf are pretty good rifles. But optics is actually something that you really need to invest in. And that's the way I look at it. This is an investment. You know, your rifle is an investment as well, but you can't get what you have out of your rifle. You can't enjoy the accuracy that you're buying with your rifle unless you have a good scope. Let's talk brakes and suppressors, Todd. Um, brakes and suppressors are, are becoming really popular in, in these communities and shooting, specifically the precision shooting community. I mean, we've been using these cans for the last week now, and um, it's just so nice to be shooting. But let's talk a little bit about brakes. You know, a lot of guys see in precision rifles a typical crown, um, you know, and they're you know maybe afraid or they're 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 wanting to venture into maybe putting a possible brake on. And so, what are some things we need to look for when we're doing that? All right, now, there's a lot of different types of brakes out there, you know, anywhere from the uh, 50 cal brakes, you know, that have that huge belt, sure. sends a lot of overpressure back and around, to something like this. This is actually a real nice comp brake uh, that you can slide your can straight over, but this actual brake has a larger port right here. This is more like for a right-handed shooter to where, you know, when you stand up and you shoot that weapon system, it's going to move our mask because it's it, the recoil's on the right side of our body. So if anything, the gun's going to want to move high and right. Well, they've actually uh, increased the gas pressure moving out of the right side of the gun. So now it's sending, you know, the barrel this way as opposed to normal recoil. So now it's, it kind of equals out, and that's what we're looking for. So as, as soon as I shoot, I'm staying on target, and, you know, whether you're shooting gas guns, bolt guns, it really doesn't matter. What we're really looking for is less felt recoil. Sure. You know, we want to keep that gun on target the whole time. And with some of the brakes that we're actually shooting today, man, they are they are so nice. You know, other than they are loud, you know, obviously they're gonna be a lot more, you know, a lot louder than just a crown barrel, which crown barrels are still, you know, very, very acceptable. Great hunting, you know, weapon systems as far as uh, whether you want to crown it, whether you, whether you want to put a brake on it, if you want to put a can on it. You know, personally, uh, some of my hunting rifles still just are crowned. You know, uh, I know I have friends in the competitive side. Well, you're not out there shooting all day long, you know, like like probably what you're going to go into talking about competitors. You know, those guys don't want to put 308 or 300 Win Mag or even 338 on their shoulder for, you know, 50 rounds without having a brake or a can on. That's where I started getting into brakes because I was shooting so much. Um, 
you know, I needed to find the, the best thing for me. And I went through multiple breaks until I started finding the, the ones out there that really worked for me with that felt re recoil. Absolutely, the, uh, the, the felt recoil is really what we're looking for. You know, it, it's, it's going to be louder. We accept that. You know, you can get a suppressor for, to put on your brake if you want to quieten it back down. But as, as far as the main thing that I look for in a, in a good brake is that felt recoil. I want, I want to take that off my, my weapon system so that my sights stay on target the whole time. Yeah, and what guys I think need to be careful of is when they're going out there and they've got that crown hunting rifle where they're building a precision rifle up, um, you know, who's turning that thing down and who's who's uh, who's threading it for you? Because, I mean, I've like I said, I've even got my own CNC equipment at my house, but that's something that you've got to be a, a thousand percent accurate within the truing process because I've seen people blow up cans just like that when they Absolutely. throw a suppressor on there and next thing you know, pop, they just wasted thousand plus dollars. Yeah, you know, and it's one of those things that yeah, I agree with you a hundred percent. You need to have somebody skilled doing that job, you know, and as, as far as looking at different types of brakes that you can actually put on as well, you know, you may decide you want to put a 338 brake on a 308 weapon system. You know, I, I run anywhere from my 338 cans like this here on my TRG42. It can fit on my 300 Win Mag on my MSR. It can also fit on my Surgeon 308 because I'll run the same brake across three different types of weapon systems. And I'm not really getting any lack of accuracy either. You know, it has more volume. It's a little bit larger. You know, it's not, you know, a 308 can on the 308 gun, which is actually a little bit smaller. But what you're going to get out of it because it does have more volume, from what I can tell, it's actually a little bit quieter. You know, so no, I and, and I'm not yeah. really looking for the quietness. You know, my side is it's it's all about the accuracy. You know, with a suppressor, you get increase in accuracy. The bullet is actually leaning, leaving in a lot cleaner air. Instead of having the gases from a crown, you know, skew out the left or right side, depending on how good your crown is, you know, those gases are going to encompass that bullet. But what you're going to find with the suppressor, the gases are actually going around that bullet as it leaves. You know, and some people will talk about suppressors increase the muzzle velocity. Well, you really don't want that. You know, I don't want to have two different dope sheets for my suppressed weapon system and my unsuppressed. That's a good you, point. You know, yeah. these actually increase, I'm going to be honest, most of mine are about 15, you know, feet per second difference. But, you know, like I said, you're going to have some impact shifts from some cans, and that's what you got to be aware of. The problem with some cans, you take it off and you're, you know, 1.5 mils low at, at 100 meters, you know, when you put your can on, you take it off and now you're way high. So again, harmonics, everything, barrel length, barrel stiffness, you know, most of my cans are zero. You know, the, probably the most I have is on my 308 cans, I may have like a 0.4 shift is all I get, you know, on my guns, but I shoot, you know, fairly stiff barrels most of the time. But when I move into my 338s and my 300s with the 338 cans on them, I have zero impact shift. You know, with a 27 inch barrel, when we were doing the testing, I would get 0.2 mil shift, you know, so, and which is very acceptable in my books. You know, that 0.2 mil, that was fine, you know, but beware. That's not with all not cans. All. A absolutely. And there's a lot of manufacturers, and, you know, I know a lot of them and actually friends with a lot of them in, in the industry that, that make cans. Uh, but do your homework, find out what you're looking for. And, you know, it may be a price, it may be because somebody lives close to you and you think that, you know, you have more accessibility for, you know, if you're looking at warranty or whatever. And really, there's not much even maintenance on these cans. Uh, to be honest, I've shot, I can't tell you how many thousands of rounds, you know, through my cans. I haven't cleaned one yet. Yeah. So, you know, if I was going about to, that too. Yeah, if I was yeah. actually going to clean it, I would get a uh, ultrasonic cleaner, put it in there and let it run and knock out all that carbon out of there. You know, you can actually increase the weight of the can just in carbon alone. But, you know, like I said, I've shot, I don't know how many thousands of rounds through these cans already, and I haven't cleaned them yet. You know, you may take a brush and just run through and make sure each surface area going down through those baffles is actually clean and removed from carbon. Sure. Just running a brush with Impro 7 on it is, but as far as actually stripping the, the carbon out of them, I haven't done it yet. You know, I, I bought an ultrasonic cleaner just in case, you know, I was I was ignorant at the time. I didn't even know, you know, how long they would last for I'd have to do that cleaning. And as soon as I saw a degradation in accuracy, I'd go ahead and do that test and see what I could get out of it. But right now we haven't seen the need to actually go in and do any cleaning. Yeah.
Well, cr cans are a really great thing to have. A lot of people look at them as, hey, it's that tactical looking thing on the front of your gun. Um, I mean, we, how we shot all week long without any ear pro in. And that's, the, I mean, you can't ask for more than that when you're running 338s and, and 300s and, um, and just the, the recoil difference that you get. And um, it, you can actually talk and hear people, you know, on the range if you got your kids out there or you're teaching them or something like that. Um, it's just a great way to, to run a gun. And, and I like the, the, um, the economic of, of like what you said, if, if you can't afford $5,000 worth of cans, get one. Yeah, yeah, you may have a little bit more mass here on the end of your gun, but if that's what you're looking for, you can outfit every one of these guns with one can. Um, you know, I grew up, I didn't have cans growing up, you know, and I had never really shot around uh, suppressed weapons, but it'll hook you. As, as soon as you get out and you go try, it's one of those things, you get out there and you shoot all day without Air Pro, you know, and, and it's so nice. You can sit there and you can talk to your buddies on the line. And even for me in, in the training environment, when I have a team comes in, we're fully suppressed, you know, all week long doing training, you know, and we'll take them off and do some quick tests, you know, point of impact shifts, that kind of thing, making sure our dope's still good at, at distance and, and, and working different type of, types of technique. What you're going to find is that week of suppressed shooting is so enjoyable compared to unsuppressed. Absolutely. You know? so Absolutely. I, I think it really does bring another level of enjoyment to shooting. Uh, you do have an increase in accuracy from what I've seen from most weapon systems. Uh, it, it's, it's probably nominal, but there is some there. It, but really when you get down to it, it just brings that level of enjoyment up a little bit, shooting suppressed weapons. It's not because it's high speed or, you know, no. it looks cool. To me, it's just like you talked about. It's nice not to have to wear ear pro and be able to take that shot, whether you're shooting a 338 down to 556. Five, yeah, absolutely. So when guys are uh, looking for breaks and cans, biggest thing is, I mean, most of these guns now, um, like that are sitting here, um, to the exception of some of these really custom guns, come already threaded and trued, ready to go. Um, but if you're gonna do it yourself, make sure you got somebody that's professional doing it and uh, make sure you're, you're, you're you're doing your homework on your can, like you said. Absolutely. Well, we've got a big collection of support equipment here, and uh, let's, let's talk about this a little bit. We utilize these PDAs heavily in the class, and this was a real eye-opener for me about what a, what a great backup tool you know, the, the, this A-Track software is to, for these long-range shooting solutions. You know, really, uh, the, the ballistic solvers have really changed the way that we look at long-range shooting today. Uh, where we used to have to go out and gather dope and shoot it every 100 meters or every 100 yards all the way back and spend a lot of time and spend a lot of ammo gathering that dope, now we can actually gather very accurate dope whether we're doing it at sea level or at 10,000 foot. And actually all you have to do then is go in and change your density altitude corrections for this barometric pressure and temperature and humidity. And now you still have the correct dope for that weapon system. So really it's probably the number one piece of equipment that I would say for a long, long range precision shooter is to have that ballistic solver. You know, what we've been using is the uh, ATRAG version from Horus Vision. And really what really se separates it and puts it apart from all the others is the fact that you can actually true it. You know, and, and unless you have the truing option, it's just a predictive polynomial curve. So again, the key word there being predictive, you know, it's a close mathematical guess. You know, actually when we true it, it becomes more than that, it actually becomes an actual algorithm. Now we know that if you don't actually really know your BC exactly, you know, and you shoot through a chronograph, you, if you're putting bad information into a PDA, you're going to get bad information out. So and we saw, you know, is, you know the, the the bullet doesn't lie, and that, that's hard to argue with. Ab absolutely. You know, you, bottom line, I mean, the, the investment in in a system like this, at first, might be a, a little intimidating for a shooter getting into this community, but you know, where my mind goes with it is is, is the savings in time and ammunition and and just absolutely days and days out there on the range. I mean, I think we could still eventually make those hits, but. This just seems to get you there a lot faster. Yeah, it, it really does. You know, and it, it, as you change density altitude, and you're moving around, you know, up and down in temperature. Even if we stay at the same altitude, just the temperature swings that you're going to start seeing, you know, in this part of the world, you know, if you don't have a ballistic solver, and you'd have to run out there and regather all that dope again. So, you know, ballistic solvers again, I really think are the ultimate tool for a long range precision shooter. But like you said, when you mentioned uh, the price of it, you're looking at $300 for a chip for the military version. You know, they make civilian models that are a little bit cheaper. Uh, but then, you know, you look at something like this, the WizWheel that we actually created, 
the Wizwheel actually gives you the same capability. It's not multi-gun without changing the interior wheel. But with this device, you can still true. So it's not just a fancy range card, all right? This is actually a full-blown ballistic solver that can do the same computations as we get out of a, you know, a PDA with a track. Uh, so a great backup to have if the batteries went dead or maybe you forgot your PDA heading to the range. Absolutely. That's just standard or equipment. batteries go dead, you know, yeah. something like that. So just kind of standard equipment to keep in your case with your rifle. Absolutely. It, it's we, what we call it is the accuracy first backup ballistic computer. And for that reason, we really consider it to be the backup, you know. And when I came up with the idea, I actually held it and kept it quiet for a long time because what I didn't want to see happen is our boys going off to fight down range and the military actually buying this because it was cheaper even though it would work you know and work well the problem is that has multiple guns it's very fast it does some different things for us you know that are military only that allows our boys to do their job better and actually I wanted to keep you know keep this held back until the Army had down selected to it and the Marine Corps as well so once they done that I went ahead and I'm releasing this now which is you know it's for 50 bucks you're gonna find that you know it, it's a it's a great tool for even the the common shooter the hunter you know that he can actually utilize a ballistic solver it still has the same true in options and make gives you a closer to an actual algorithm than just a predictive mathematical guess that's awesome you know and then you look at some of the other products that we have here you know if we go up and we do high angle shooting with the guys a lot up in Utah at my other facility you know in here you have a angle cosine ind indicator that gives you degrees and your cosine so again it has a level on top you know kind of like some of the other levels that you were looking at here this is a prototype here of my level this is actually a three position level here that's tritium and of course it's a mill only uh, level but you know we make the same models without the tritium vial in there for the hunting market you know as you've seen it's very important to make sure that reticles level you know once you get off for that sure. golf course range it, it's one of those things that at distance it really starts showing and proving itself. You know, I've seen th this this piece of equipment's kind of a, a controversial piece, whether you need it on your scope, your gun, or you're starting to kind of get bogged down with the gear, but uh, I'd, I'd advocate anybody that's gonna step into your world and, and start shooting at these ranges. So I can see even at 500 meters, uh, what, what a huge benefit having this level on, on my weapon system would have been. And and the cosine indicator, you know, we didn't do a whole lot of high angle shooting, but for, um, for you know, shots like that and other creative shots, I mean, I can see how this would be, you know, it, it, it could definitely help you out. Yeah, it's kind of one of those tools that when you need it, there's nothing to supplement for it, you know. Uh, we teach guys how to actually, you know, have lines on their stock to show them their angle to where they can actually aim at the target and look at the line on their stock pointing at their feet and he actually gives them their angle. So again, it's a backup to the, the tool that you have in your hand. But you know, those pieces of, of equipment are very useful when you need them. As far as magazines go, I mean, what do you look for uh, in a good quality magazine? All right, really reliability is number one. You know, a lot of the problems that we've had in the past with a lot of weapon systems as far as malfunction have come from mags, you know, and, and, and nowadays there's some really high quality mags out there that really, it's not just another piece of kit, it's actually what keeps the gun running. So, you know, it, that's something the, the viewer really needs to be aware of. And it's one of those pieces of kit that you really can't skimp on. A bad mag will shut your weapon system down. So it, it's, they're not very expensive, just make sure you buy the right high quality gear. And something else that you really need to be aware of, you know, once you're shooting out to the ranges that we were shooting at, you know, trying to actually see trace, you know, is, is something that we rely on a whole bunch. And the trace or actual impact or where you're impacting on target. You know, this is a Koa 20 by 60 spot and scope. One, probably one of the best spot and scopes that you're actually going to find. The problem with it is you can't get it with a reticle. You know, a lot of the scopes that we are actually using, like this Leopold, uh, you can actually put the H32 reticle in it, or if you prefer a Gen 2 mil dot, you know. But it actually gives you a measuring device in the spotting scope. And it's not only for spotting, it may be for talking onto a target, you know, to where I can say, hey, Mike, you know, uh, do you see that big rock in the middle of the range? Roger, got it. All right, give me 10 mils up, give me 13 mils right. Do you see that target? You know, and you go, oh, yeah, I'm on it that quick. Sure. So we don't, you know, we don't have to go, hey, give me two fingers right of the rock and, you know, one finger up and everybody's kind of trying to guess and you're off on a different target. And, and you see that a lot, you know, before we had the measuring units inside of the spotting scope. So, you know, a good high quality piece of glass like this is a great piece of kit that you're actually going to want for long range shooting. 
So before we had nice uh, you know, tripod systems like this one from Frodo here, um, you know, th this is an old unit that uh, you know, I, I think you know, pretty commonplace and you know, easy to recognize from the military community. You know, just, just going down to the hardware store and picking up a, uh, a cheap tripod and throwing something together. But I mean, it's, it, it, you know, really, you know, truly the, the configurations you can put these uh, spotting scopes onto now with these new mounting systems. I mean, it, it's just, it's just remarkable. You know, being able to get into the alternate positions and actually use these as a shooting aid and be able to run my, my weapon system with, you know, something a little bit more unconventional than, uh, you know, like this, this old unit here. You know, with the old unit, the problem was you couldn't actually, it, it was what it was. And you couldn't actually get lower to the ground. It, it, you kind of had what you had with it. Where this system here, that thing will actually lay flat out on the ground, just pull the legs up, and you're flat laying there on the ground spotting for your partner. You know, or you can actually manipulate the legs to where you can use it as a shooting platform and actually shoot off of it sitting on the side of a hill somewhere. You know, and you look at this, the modularity allows you to actually get the center of gravity of, of this system here with the PVS 27 which is probably the best I squared device made to man right now with, with the Leopold now we can actually place that center of gravity so that when you do grab your handle here and release that it stays in one place instead if it was always just stuck out here at the very front as soon as you grab it it would dip down and you're gonna have to settle way up high let go and then let it settle back down into the target so the modularity of what we're actually doing with some of these systems now is incredible you know so it's one of those things whether you're using like the FLIR Hiss thermal probably the best thermal made right now and mounting it up here which is a little bit heavier it still gives us that ability to adjust that center of gravity awesome so if you're in a job or a lifestyle that actually affords you to use some of the shooting equipment with night vision um, let's talk a little bit about like okay this this PVS 27 the, it's a clip on optic goes out in front of your day optic I don't have to take my scope off I can just pop this out on one of the rails and um, you know, same as the FLIR hiss there, but sometimes guys are running 14s on guns. Uh, what do you think about that? Yeah, actually, uh, we have a 14 here, and, and really, it's, it's not a bad system. It's one of those deals. It, it depends on what you're doing, what type of system that you're running it with, as opposed to, you know, this is really for long range as well as the hiss. You know, it doesn't always necessarily have to be at long range to be valuable. You know, and this is a very good system, PVS 14, that we actually put behind the optics, you know. So, whether you're running this or running the white light system that we have on the OBR up front, you know, which is a great tool for, you know, whether you're tactical or just hunting, you know, it, it, it's a great piece of kit to actually have and utilize, you know, but another good piece of kit that we haven't covered yet is laser range finders. Now this is a Plurfo 5. This, this unit actually sells for about $2,000 and it's the only unit that I've seen that will reach out to two grand for that price for this size. So, you know, this is probably, the absolute best laser rangefinder that I've actually used when you actually start comparing price and size. You know, then you have other units like the PLRF 15C. The C means it has a compass in it. Now, this unit, whether we was looking at the 05 that will reach out two grand, no problem. We've actually mounted it on a tripod and hit out past 3,000. This unit here will go out past 5,000. So it has inclination in it, in it as well as azimuth. All right, so this is a really nice piece of kit. This, this is actually gonna run you somewhere about $7,000. But again, when it reaches out to five grand, for some, you know, most of us don't need to go that far anyway, but for some of the guys that are going downrange, this is a wonderful piece of kit. And if you have the money and you want one of the best systems available at, the, at this size, you know, this is a very good piece of kit. You know, another one that we've actually moved into is the Mosquito. The Mosquito, this will go out 10 clicks, you know, so it'll reach out 10,000 meters. It has a flip on it so you can go into night vision very quickly. So this actually incorporates night vision inside the system. It's a very nice high quality tube inside that you can actually have your adjustable focus here for your night vision. So this piece of kit, again, this is running anywhere between $16,000 and $20,000. Obviously, it's not something everybody's going to have one or two of sitting around the house. But, you know, this is probably when you start looking at, you know, from not what I'd consider bottom level, but from... Uh, the lower scale being 2,000 meters to 10,000 meters with night vision, you know, this, these are some of the probably the best laser range finders that you're going to get your hands on. You know, there's other optics out there that you can utilize, but what you have to understand, you know, whether they already give you the calculation for range, that necessarily may not be correct, you know, and when you do high angle shooting, you know, and you're shooting 800 meters at 60 degrees, 
you know, the, the old cosine math, you know, a lot of guys will say, hey, yeah, but 60 is half, so it's 400 meter dope. But the reality is at 800 meters, at that 60 degree down angle, you're gonna miss by shooting at 400 meter dope. So you have to understand where the capabilities really are and, and understand that sometimes that might not work. And really, some companies may say that, you know, their laser rangefinder will reach out whether it's you know 400 or 800 or 1200 or 1600 you really need to go out and test it because what we've actually looked at and when we decided to pick laser range finders the aiming reference point that you actually utilize on this to actually know where your laser is hitting these are very refined and that's what we want you don't want something that's going to cover up a pickup truck when you're trying to range a target at 800 and the target may be a deer so you know that's something the size of the diode the capability uh, you need, really need to be aware and do your homework. All right, obviously everything sitting here isn't something that I have to have every trip to the range or, uh, or out on my hunt, but if you could just kind of put it in a nutshell for me, what, 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 what's your, your bare minimum load here if you wanted to go out and you know, spend a day shooting? You know, obviously, I'm a huge believer in levels, you know, as well as, you know, a ballistic solver. You know, my deal is those items don't cost that much. You're looking at 50 bucks here, and in a level doesn't cost that much as well. But and you can do mill relation formula for your range estimation. But I'm a huge fan of, of good optics. You know, when you're looking at a laser range finder, you don't have to go out and spend two thousand dollars to get a good quality unit. You know, you maybe only be shooting out to eight hundred meters, which one of the you know thousand twelve hundred meter uh, laser range finders may work extremely well for you. But obviously. When you're shooting long range, range is very important, you know, as far as knowing the exact range. So a good laser range finder, a good level, a good PDA or some kind of ballistic solver is very important. You know, spotting scopes, you don't have to have, again, if you have good glass, you may be able to spot for yourself. But, you know, initially, absolutely, I would look at, you know, something like a A-Track ballistic solver or the whiz wheel a level good range finder and an optic you know you don't have to have all the night vision gear or go out and spend thirty five hundred dollars or four thousand you know on a big optic so obviously we have a lot of money sitting around us right now but you know when it really comes down to it there are several little key pieces of gear that you really want to have you know a good laser range finder a nice optic you know maybe an option it depends on the ranges that you're actually trying to shoot but a ballistic solver whether it's in a whiz wheel form or a pda in a good level in my opinion are, are necessary items and another essential piece of kit is actually a handheld weather station you know there are several different units out there uh, that range in prices but this is probably the ultimate that you're actually going to find it's a Kestrel 4500 you know it gives you barometric pressure temperature humidity as well as wind so you know as far as essential pieces of kit obviously I'd want a handheld weather station because density altitude is really going to impact on where my bullets going to strike down range you know and to know that once I gather that information I'm going to want some kind of ballistic solver whether it's a whiz wheel or the A-Track ballistic computer or even the A-Track ballistic computer in your watch. Because it's on your wrist, you know, you're gonna actually incorporate some problems because temperature is not exactly the same. Plus, most of them are black like this one, but this is actually a 511 that actually has the A-Track system in it. You know, it may be a little bit slower, but again, it's a great backup. It's the exact same ballistic solver, but in a, in a watch. Something like that along with a level because as you've seen, you know, how much variations that you're gonna have on your impact if you aren't level or not. You know, in a good spotting scope, if you have somebody going with you as well as you know a laser rangefinder that is high quality but really that would really kind of sum it up you know it's not a optic on my gun or my gun we're you know we're looking at the accessories to that and, and obviously these are probably the most important that you'll find